Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Big Bend National Park is not simply a park you pass along the way. Located in West Texas along the U.S.-Mexico border, this 1,252 square mile park is five hours from the closest commercial airport. In other words, you must make Big Bend your final destination if you're going to visit. You're not going to happen upon it as you drive down the road. But once there, you're likely to be astounded by the ruggedness, the beauty of the Chisos mountain range that falls entirely within the borders of the national park and the rich cultural history preserved here. This is Kurt Rappencheck, your host at the National Parks Traveler. Aside from the natural beauty of Big Bend, there's a lot going on there that's going to affect most visitors. There's work to design a new lodge. There's the question of whether official wilderness designation should be applied to some of the park's landscape. And there are staffing issues and even wildlife issues. The Traveler's Lynn Riddick traveled to Big Bend to discuss these issues and more with Superintendent Bob Krummenacker. We'll get into their conversation after a short break. The Everglades Foundation, the only organization whose sole mission is to restore and protect America's Everglades. Learn more at evergladesfoundation.org. Whether it be strategy, business planning, change management, board development, executive search, or diversity planning, Potrero Group is here to help. They mix a depth of experience in the parks and land space with a breadth of best practices from other industries. For more information or to schedule a preliminary conversation, go to potrerogroup.com. P-O-T-R-E-R-O group.com. Full of stunning photography and thought-provoking reads, Smoky's Life is a biannual magazine produced by Great Smoky Mountains Association. Members receive it free of charge each spring and fall, and it is available for purchase in retail stores throughout Great Smoky Mountains National Park and online at smokiesinformation.org. Okay, so I'm here in Big Bend National Park, and I'm sitting with Bob Krummenacker, who is the uh, park superintendent. Hi, Bob. Welcome to The Traveler. Hi, Lynn. It's good to see you. I know... A little more than a year ago, I was here and I did an interview with your chief of interpretation, Tom Vandenberg, and I asked him every question I could possibly think of. So uh, we don't have to cover all that territory <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> again. And that was episode 151. So if anybody wants to go back and listen to that, it's a very thorough. Well, I shouldn't say thorough because there's a lot to this park, but it was a good one though. I remember. Thank you. Yeah, we we got into a lot of a uh, lot of information about this park. So, anyway, well, without any further ado, how are you? How are things in the park? Well, I'm well. Thank you for asking. The park is doing well. We're in that transition season right now where winter, even though it's it's warm, it's over 80 degrees today. It's a little warm for February, but we're getting the taste of what spring break and spring will be, um, and we just finished Washington's birthday holiday, which was very crowded in the park. Again, a taste of March. March is the busiest season in this park, but we're ready. We're looking forward to people, and we had a lot of rain a couple weeks ago, so we're hoping it's going to be a good wildflower season. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about the most recent rainfall, when that was, you say a couple weeks ago? That storm that was hitting much of the west, um, it's, it's, what, February 21st today, so, yeah, it was probably about two weeks ago. We had three or four days of cloud and humid, and we actually got over an inch of rain in much of the park, which is just remarkable. Right, because don't you usually get, like, only six inches a year anyway? It depends on your elevation, but the lowest elevations in the park get somewhere between six and nine, and up in the Chisos Basin, maybe 12 to 15, and we're in the middle elevation, so somewhere in between over here. Well, as a woman who lives in South Texas, I'm always excited when I see my first blue bonnet sighting <laughs> of the year. And I did see some blue bonnets down there on the way to uh, uh, the Boquillos Canyon Trail. Oh, good. Oh, good. Well, I was on the river in Boquillos Canyon last week, and someone has to do that, you know. So I have yet to see my first blue bonnet, but I look forward to that. So thank you for the scouting report. Good, yeah. It almost seemed like they grew taller from... The way there to the way back. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you know, the Big Bend blue bonnet is a different subspecies, and it is much taller than the very famous blue bonnets of, of the hill country in Texas. So you have a higher density of blue bonnets where you live, but we have much taller ones 
every few years when they actually have enough rainfall to grow. Oh, good. They did look a little spindly to me, so that explains it. That is the nature. No, they'll be three or four feet high at in peak season. It's incredible. I'd like to see that. Well, you'll I'd have like to come to back in a few weeks. Okay. Well, this is my third time here in 14 months, and I, I wanted to hit this particular time because I wanted to sort of avoid the spring breakers in March and then the Easter holiday in April. Good so, planning. Yeah. So it's plenty hot today. Um, just sort of an unfortunate thing I'll ask you about is that there was a fatality on Saturday on the Pinnacles Trail. I I read that in your visitor center here. And that's so unfortunate. It makes me very sad. Uh, The very next day, I mean, unbeknownst to me, we were on that same trail. You've used the word unfortunate. It's the one that comes to mind as well. It was a gentleman in his 50s. And um, I don't know his medical history, but he had apparently a massive heart attack on the trail. He was also a Boy Scout leader, and so uh, the tragedy in addition to the one for he and his family is that this was witnessed by a lot of kids who knew him. Um, There was a cardiologist right there. I'm not sure whether that was another scout leader or just good fortune on the trail. They did CPR for quite a long time, but unsuccessfully. And so it was a recovery more so than a rescue, and um, our staff carried him out and uh, unfortunately four or five times a year someone dies in Big Bend National Park and uh, four or five times a year yeah well this is a big park and and it is a place where people come and sometimes the weather or the environmental conditions get to them other times their own bodies get to them and with over half a million visitors a year and a lot of trails I don't want to ever say this is normal, but it's not really unusual for us. And I can say that always at the back of my mind, whenever I'm hiking out on any of the trails here or even driving through the park, just how difficult a rescue would be if I were to get in trouble. The unsung heroes are the park rangers and volunteers who go out and in all weather conditions day and night and go to hopefully rescue and save people who get in trouble, but sometimes they have to do body recoveries. So they don't get much notice, but those are the real heroes. Unfortunately, they were not able to save this gentleman, and we, of course, feel terrible for he and his family. Yes. I saw a guy yesterday, I shouldn't laugh, um, and I'm not going to laugh because we were down at Santa Elena Canyon, and there was a big wrecker truck there, and... I said, hey, what happened? And he said, I dropped my keys and my phone. I was kayaking, and I dropped them in the river. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Poor guy. Oh my goodness. Right? It- That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's just so easy to get into trouble here because it's so remote and so harsh. And it's a long way from help. Fortunately, that wasn't a medical condition, but it was certainly an expensive thing for him because we're 100 miles from a wrecker. I have no idea what that man had to pay, but it was a lot of money. And it was a huge wrecker that, you know, probably got, you know, eight miles to the gallon right. from Marathon. And uh, I'm probably sure... Probably from like, Alpine, actually. Oh, from Alpine. Okay. Probably. And, so. and no doubt he had to pay all of it. And yes, um, so always carry a spare set of keys. <laughs> I just wanted to ask a little bit about uh, the bear situation. I understand that there's a light hibernation season for bear. So right now, February... We won't see any bear, is that correct? Probably not, but this light hibernation is not... I mean, it's it's light. They wake up occasionally. They will go around occasionally. And, and today is very warm. If we have several days of very warm, I bet these bears will wake up. And they'll be a bit groggy, um, and they'll be looking around. But um, it's not as likely to see a bear this time of year, but it's certainly not impossible. And last year you had to close the Chisos Basin campground, is that correct, because some bears were passing through and as a, a safety measure? Well, it wasn't just passing through. They do that all the time, and we're okay with that. We actually had closed the window trail just before that. So we had a couple issues. On the trail, we had an injured bear. We think it was bears fighting with one another that was hanging out right on the trail, in fact, right on a bench similar to the one we're sitting on. And there was just too much opportunity for something to go wrong. An injured bear is not a happy bear, and we didn't want any people to encounter that. So fortunately, both that and the campground closure that followed was in August. 
August is hot. It is the least visited time of year, so it didn't impact too many people. But we were in drought last year, and, and even though we've had recent rain, we're not really totally out of the drought. And so the bears were hungry. There wasn't a lot of food, and the cactus uh, blooms were poor last year. There weren't many fruits around. So by middle of summer, they were really looking for mesquite beans, which was their one of their prime food sources, and they're all over the Chisos Basin campground. So even though we hazed the bears to some to some extent, they were hanging out and eating in the campground, and again, for their own safety as well as the visitors, we just closed the campground for a few weeks. And, you know, my view on this is it's the bear's home, we're the guests, and while I realize it inconveniences people, the good news is we were able to relocate every person who had a campsite reservation to some other campsite in the park. Maybe not as cool, maybe not as great a view, but there was a place for them to camp. And and the bears ultimately moved away when they it, it rained a little bit in late August and September, and presumably they had more food somewhere else. Well, I was fortunate to see two bears when I was here in June, um, what is that, eight months ago, mm-hmm. from the safety of my vehicle as I was driving <laughs> up the road toward the basin and a couple of bear crossed the road. Oh, how exciting. Yeah, it was. It's You want to see bear. You do. Uh, you know, but not too close. Right. Absolutely. So tell me about the nesting peregrine falcons going on now, and uh, you've got a trail closed. Uh, What's that kind of population like here in the park? You know, the falcons have been doing so well, they've been taken off the endangered species list, which also means we're not monitoring them as closely as we once were. So I can't tell you how many peregrine falcon nests we have in the park. Um, But we're guessing, in fact, I was just talking to one of our biologists a couple days ago, we're guessing we probably have 10 to 20 pairs in the park. And, and of course, the high mountain cliffs in, in the Chisos Basin are prime nesting habitat. And so this particular area on the east and south rims is a very common place for peregrines to nest. And so, again, we're just trying to protect them from any disturbance that we may cause. And I forget how long the closure lasts, but it's during the prime nesting season. That trail will open up again in a few months. Okay, good. And we've been doing this annually in the and the falcons are doing well, so we think we've got something going that works. Fantastic. Great to hear. Tell me about what's going on with the desert bighorn sheep and the reduction of the non-native uh, Audad population. Well, we don't have a lot of bighorns in the park, and to be honest, I can't give you an estimate. We haven't counted them in a very, very long time. But they compete very directly with these non-native Barbary sheep, also known as Audads. They're from Africa. And uh, the Audads do better than the sheep do. They're very well adapted to this environment. So they are a problem throughout the high country in West Texas. It's not unique to Big Bend National Park. We have a very good working relationship with Texas Parks and Wildlife. And on just about an annual basis, uh, through a cooperative agreement that costs the federal taxpayers nothing, uh, the state uh, will go in and very carefully figuring this out with our biologists and we'll close an area of the park and we will do aerial gunnery. People don't like that sometimes, but <laughs> we will shoot the audads from the air. Um, and last year, it was either 85 or 90 audads that we were able to kill on the west side of the park in the Dead Horse Mountains and Bokeas Canyon area. Do you just leave them where they lay? We do. The terrain is such that it would be almost impossible for us to go in and recover them, um, and uh, and so they become food for other wildlife. Where did those audads come from? I don't know the origin, to be honest. Um, they have been in the park for a while. I know they're up in the Davis Mountains north of us, but what the origin, uh, this is pure speculation on my part, but I bet it's got a good chance of being true. There are a lot of hobby ranches in Texas where people bring in exotic wildlife within fences uh, for hunting. And odds are they escaped. And you know whether it happened once or it happened multiple times, I don't know, but um, they're now naturalized. It will be impossible to ever get rid of them completely, I think. I'm Lynn Riddick, speaking with Big Bend Park Superintendent, Bob Krummenacker, and we'll be back after this short break. listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. 
The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to raise private support to deepen everyone's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Yosemite Conservancy helps visitors connect with Yosemite through adventures, volunteering, and the arts. It's the only nonprofit dedicated to supporting Yosemite National Park and funds grants to improve trails, restore habitat, protect wildlife, and inspire the next generation of nature lovers. Learn more at yosemite.org. I'm Lynn Riddick, back now with Big Bend Park Superintendent Bob Krummenacker. Another thing that was in the news recently was the rediscovered oak tree. Tell me a little bit about that. This tree's been there a long time. We just didn't know it was a different species. So um, our biologists and cooperators from a university that, unfortunately, I can't remember which it is, had some reason to suspect that this particular species of oak was still somewhere in the park, and they surveyed the best habitat, which is in the high country in the Chisos, and indeed they found this one specimen that appears to be a, a species that we had long thought was, was gone from here. So we don't tell anybody exactly where it is because we want to protect it. Well, that was my next question. Where is it exactly? It's, it's up there in the mountains somewhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, we're visiting right about 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, and the visitor center is packed with people. So this must be a prime time for people to be coming into the park or leaving. And it, how's staffing? Well, those are two unrelated questions. Unfortunately, <laughs> our staff doesn't necessarily go up when the visitors do. So we've just come off of a holiday weekend, and so the park was very busy. And uh, because this place is so far from where you live and where most visitors live, um, you know, sometimes our holiday periods extend longer because if you're going to come all this way to Big Bend, you don't want to leave the next day. So, you know, the people coming in are presumably going to be here over the next several days. And, and so often late afternoon or mid to late afternoon is a busy time where you're having both the people coming and going. And if you're going somewhere else, it's at least two hours to the next place where you can stay overnight. So you want to get a head start on that. We are in the beginning of our busy season, so we are as well staffed in theory as we ever are. Um, but it's just park service is not that different from the rest of the economy right now in that there are more jobs than there are people who want them. And it used to be when I was young in the park service, park service jobs were really hard to get. So the secret is if you're well qualified and you can figure out how to fill out the application, which is not easy, there are some really good jobs here that we would love to fill. Um, but we are, we've also had um, some good fortune befall some of our staff who've gotten great opportunities to go somewhere else. But the gap between when we know that someone's leaving and our ability to fill behind them, unfortunately, is longer than it has to be. So we're going into the busy season more sparsely staffed than I would prefer. Well, if I were younger, I certainly would uh, want to try to be a park ranger. We have no age limits. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. Okay, thank you. So I noticed that there's some kind of construction going on behind the visitor center where we're talking at right now. And then I think there's some uh, a proposal in the works for a communication tower. Tell me about those projects. Okay. Well, the one right next to us is a two-part project. Phase one is a parking lot, which will serve park staff and our cooperator, the Big Bend Natural History Association. Um, right now, we have... Um, despite what I said about staff, between the government cars and the personal cars of the employees, there's not enough spaces for those folks to park. So for years, they've been parking on our service road, uh, which isn't particularly safe for them or anyone else. We got funding several years ago from the National Park Service for the expansion of a parking lot. And because I think sustainability is something that's really important and alternative energy is really important, 
we added to that project, which was in the works, at least in the planning stages before I arrived in the park, we added a um, set of shade structures that will protect the cars from the sun as well as from hail damage. And phase two, which hasn't started yet, will be putting solar panels on top of those. So phase one is funded by the National Park Service, and phase two is funded 100% by our philanthropic partner, the Big Bend Conservancy. And they've gotten money from private donors as well as the National Park Foundation. And so phase one, which now is in the steel erection stage, which is pretty exciting, um, will be over in the next few weeks. That parking lot will be functional and the shade structures will be up and there's conduit in the ground that will go all the way to the electrical panel here at the combined headquarters and visitor center building. The contract for phase two by our partner has already been let with a company known as South Texas Solar and they're out of San Antonio. And uh, so they're now in the looking at the specs and they'll soon be procuring the solar panels and Hopefully they will start later in the spring. And they tell me that'll just be a week or two project to install the solar panels. No groundbreaking needed because all that's been done. And then it all gets connected to the electrical panel. It's a 42 kilowatt system, which is by far the largest solar system yet in Big Bend National Park. Hopefully that won't be true for very long. And that will fund, that will power uh, probably 100% of the needs of the visitor center and maybe even a little bit more. The visitor center and headquarters are combined. We don't separately meter them, but this will provide more than half the power of this building. That's that's great. We're excited about it. And you asked about the communication tower. So we are currently reviewing the comments that were received on a communication cell, cellular communication tower proposal that uh, was submitted by uh, a company called Comnet, which is a local or regional cell tower provider that then they serve as the conduit for other vendors like Verizon or AT&T. And the purpose of this tower is to provide services for something called FirstNet, which is a, a priority first responder network. And they have a national contract with the Department of Commerce to put Comnet, or sorry, FirstNet cell towers all over the country to improve first responders, um, communications, folks like ourselves and, and our cooperators. Their original proposal was to put that in the basin, and we said, hey, there's already a tower in the basin, and by the way, if you put a tower in the basin, it won't get outside the basin because it's ringed by mountains. So we work with them without taking a position on whether this was a good idea or not, we're obligated by law to consider their proposals. So they work with us pretty closely to put in a proposal for a tower that will only be 60 feet high, which is not very much higher than the existing radio towers that we already have here at headquarters, um, right deep in the headquarters area. So the visual simulations show that it will be hardly visible um, to the public and uh, it will provide improved communications for people here at the headquarters area and perhaps a few miles out. So we're reviewing the comments. We've not made a decision yet. Um, the environmental and cultural issues seem to be relatively minor. And so, um, again, without committing to what the decision will be, we'll be making that probably within the next several weeks. Will that have any ramifications for visitors and stronger uh, communication for their own cell phones or laptops or anything like that? If they're within range of that tower, um, yes, it will certainly improve their communications. We're not entirely sure right now, and this is part of what we're going back and forth with the, with the pro um, proposers, how far will that signal last? Will it be focused primarily here at Panther Junction, where I think just about everybody agrees better signal would be better? Beyond Panther Junction, we would like it to be limited to road corridors, and so we're working with them to see whether or not they can shield some of the signal so some of the wilderness areas might not have improved coverage. But people are all over the map with this one. There are some people who want improved communications for all the obvious reasons, and there are other people who come to a wilderness area to get away from that. And so we are currently reviewing the environmental issues and the technical issues, um, and we will try to steer the signal away from the wilderness, but there is, frankly, there's nothing in the law that protects wilderness from having cell signals, and we remind people they can turn these things off. If true, they want to. true. Going back to the rain uh, a couple of weeks ago, so there are tons and tons of gnats 
flying around, especially when you go down to the river, uh, the river level. So is that normal? I hadn't seen it myself. I'm not a huge expert on the park, but is, is that just a result of the rain? It is more normal than you might realize. Okay. And in fact, there were reports on social media just before the river trip that I took that the biting flies are awful on the river. We saw a lot of gnats. I didn't see personally any biting flies. But the river corridor is, is a wet place, so it's going to be insect habitat in all the warm season, and we're just starting to get into the warm season right now. The rain certainly makes them more common in the drier parts of the park, but I've been surprised at how many mosquitoes and gnats there are here at Panther Junction. We're, we are a long way from a water source. I'm Lynn Riddick, speaking with Big Bend Park Superintendent Bob Krummenacker, and we'll be back after this short break. Our partner, Interior Federal Credit Union, has given away over 2 million nickels since they started their nickel back program on their checking accounts. Learn how you can earn a nickel on your signature-based transactions at interiorfcu.org. Federally insured by NCUA. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. You can see their successes at gtnpf.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. I'm Lynn Riddick, back now with Big Bend Park Superintendent Bob Krummenacker. EV charging stations, any money for that in the new legislation like the infrastructure bill or the Inflation Reduction Act? Not yet. Um, there's a somewhat slow process that we're still waiting for information on as to it goes from Congress to the Office of Management and Budget to the agencies and then to Interior and the Park Service. So we're hopeful, but we have not heard. And, and one of the challenges with the tremendous energy and enthusiasm behind let's really ramp up EVs is that the administration put out some executive orders and they passed some bills last year. The agencies don't have time, we don't, we didn't have the time to prepare. And, and the technology has just improved so much so fast that people are frustrated that we don't have EV stations here. Um, we are too. And in fact, we do not yet have any EV vehicles, even though the administration has said by 2030 or 2035, the 100% of the federal fleet will be electric. Now, that's probably the passenger fleet. It's not the heavy vehicles that we've got. But right now, we are waiting for guidance as to what kind of chargers. And on the public side, we also have to figure out, so how are these paid for? So the National Park Service is not going to provide free electricity for the public, much as they would like us to do that. We can't sell things like that, so we probably will need to work out some arrangement with our concessioner. And so we are just about to go through a new concession contract review process. So um, I can't reveal what's in that, but there will be some opportunity for a new contract with a new concessioner to either optionally or perhaps require to provide some EV chargers. But then the other thing around this park is how do you get the electricity to right. those chargers? So, um, you know, one of the things that I have noticed a lot here, and as a frequent visitor maybe you have, is just how many electric poles we have in this park and how unsightly they are. And so right now the technology is such that solar panels cannot provide enough electricity for EV chargers at, at a reasonable ratio of how many solar panels to, to, to a charger. So you need to have wires. But we're technically on the grid here, but we're at the end of the line. So we lose power regularly, and it's, it's 100 miles to Alpine by road. It's probably 80 miles by Alpine by the, by the electric lines. And, and so there isn't necessarily an easy, let's put as many EV chargers here as we want. We are also looking at 
alternative power sources for Panther Junction here. So there's a lot of energy things that are in the pipeline, but none of them, except for this 42 kW array that we're putting in right now, none of them have materialized as yet. And it always astounds me, you know, you talk about the parking lot and the solar panels and the potential communication tower and maybe EV charging stations. You know, it's a lot to bring materials into the park. And when I look at, you know, going through the tunnel on the way to the Keos Canyon and somebody built that and brought all the materials out and just everything around the park, it's just, it boggles the mind. This park is literally at the end of the road, as you know. And so everything in the country in the construction world has gotten very expensive since the pandemic. And then you add the distance factor here. So it is difficult and extremely expensive, and it is also very difficult to find contractors who are willing to work in in this kind of environment. So yes, everything has to be brought in from somewhere else. We're not on an island. I've worked in several parks that were islands where we had those issues, but we're almost like an island. And so people who work here have to acknowledge that the beauty of this place has to make up for some of the inconvenience that we don't have all the conveniences and technologies that the rest of the world has. But I will also say that the desire of the general public, they want wilderness, but they also want their cell phones and they want their EV chargers. And they don't all have to happen in the same location, but it's getting more and more difficult to to reconcile the issue of this is a different place and it's supposed to be a different place and it's okay not to have these amenities. But if we want to attract the best people to work here, we also have to provide them good living conditions. So this will be a continual challenge for any superintendent and any park staff from now until forever. What is the latest with the renovation of the Lodge Visitor Center in the Chisos Basin and the reconstruction of the water system from the spring that feeds the park? Those are, when I talked to Tom last year, they were, you know, they were out there, but a little further down the road, and, and, and they seem like they'll be very complex. Uh, they, they are extremely complex and extremely expensive. So um, I'll give you the, the short and sweet answer. Those projects are moving along with the exception of replacing the big pipeline that goes from Oak Springs up to the basin. That was built by work camps in the 1950s in ways that we simply cannot do anymore. You cannot find people who will work under those conditions. This this, this is not building the railroads of the 1870s, but it's almost like that. And then you add the wilderness factor on top of it. So And the heat. And the heat. Well, that hasn't really changed that much. But the to do it the way that pipeline was built would be almost impossibly expensive if you could even find a contractor who would do it. So the better alternative is one that isn't quite there yet technologically or financially, which is probably a, um, a pipeline that is directional drilled underneath the mountain. But that was 80 to $100 million. And while we have a lot of money for this project, we don't have 80 to, a million, 80 to $100 million. And so what we are doing is we have tested that pipeline, identified its weak spots, and so the project will improve and extend the life of that pipeline. And I'm trying not to look at it as kicking the can down the road, but to some extent we're going to buy 10 or 20 more years out of that. And hopefully the technology and the impact of that kind of drilling will be much less 10 or 20 years from now. The rest of the project, while it's excruciatingly slow, is definitely moving forward. So the lodge conceptual design has been shared with the public that's online on our website. We did public meetings virtually um, a little less than a year ago in May. Um, That'll be a highly sustainable building with solar panels on top, highly energy efficient, pretty much on the same footprint as the existing lodge. And the funny thing about Big Bend, as you know, Lynn, is there's no lodging in the lodge. So, so the words we use are confusing, but we're replacing the main building of the lodge complex, which means the kitchen, the dining room, the bar, and the administrative facilities. We are not replacing any of the lodging units. We simply didn't have enough money for that, although it would be desirable. And there also wasn't enough money to uh, replace the visitor center, so that's not in it. So right now, that project is tentatively supposed to start demolition 
in October of 24. So it's still a year and a half away. So there's still a lot of design that has to happen between now and then, and we have to find a contractor who can do it for the amount of money that we have. Um, the other piece of that is the camper store will be removed and the retail functions will be combined with the existing retail that's in the lodge lobby. And so um, that building, while on a similar footprint, is going to be multi-story. It's going to go both down and up. And so um, it won't have any more environmental impact, but you'll pack more into that building than you have right now. How do you personally like the plan so far? I'm very excited by that. I, I think it's going to be a beautiful facility. I think it will be a better fit for its existing location. Um, some people love Mission 66, which is the architecture of the national parks from 1956 to 1966, but it's kind of cookie cutter. It's the same in every park. If you go to the Chisos Basin Lodge, it looks a lot like the Big Meadows Lodge at Shenandoah National Park, which is in a completely different environment. So this building will fit the scene much better, and it will also have, as I said, highly energy and water efficient um, functions, and um, it will also have a larger dining capacity and a outdoor dining space on the second floor. So it will be bear proof and you'll be able to eat outdoors when the weather allows. And my condition for expanding the size of the restaurant was no more water usage. So I'm hoping through the technology of the building and the kitchen and the dishwashers that will be able to be true. There's no way of really knowing because we don't know how many people it will serve, but I'm pretty excited about it and I look forward to coming back for that because I will be retired by the time that's built. <laughs> This is just a random question. I don't know if you'll have the answer to it. But when you're sitting on the patio at the restaurant outside and you're looking at that fabulous window view at night, it's dark all around, there's one little light way off in the distance. Do you know what that is? I've wondered that myself, and, and I fear there will be more lights. But that's somewhere in the Terlingua area. Um, and there are some recent studies that show that the night sky glow from Terlingua, as it is growing, is also negatively impacting the dark sky in this park. So I'll tell you something good about the view. So right now, when you're in the restaurant itself, you have a modified version of the view you just described, um, constrained by, you've got big windows, but you've got these curtains that keep the glare out, and so it's, it's actually a long and narrow view. But you can't see Casa Grande behind you, and you can't see Emory Peak to the left, you know, to the other iconic views. So the new restaurant on the second floor will have windows on three sides, and you'll have, you'll have these iconic views on three of the four sides of, of the basin. I think it'll be spectacular. Your latest announcement about almost 100 additional square miles in the north part of the park found eligible for wilderness designation. You want to talk about that sure. a little? Sure. I wish we had more time. Um, so in the 1970s, Big Bend National Park was one of many big western parks that went through a wilderness study, which was a very public process with a lot of public input. We did it twice, actually. We published one in 73. We published another in 78. The first one was actually endorsed by President Richard Nixon, um, and then the second one under the Carter administration. So under both Democrat and Republican administrations, Roughly two-thirds of the acreage of this park was recommended by the administration to the Congress we want to build. Congress never did that. But that didn't look at the north part of the park that wasn't added until the 1980s. So we just finished the first step in a wilderness process, which is the physical inventory on the ground and comparing the conditions on the ground to what the law requires if something were designated wilderness. So technically there's no recommendation here, but if Congress does move forward with a bill, which we're very hopeful will happen sometime in the next few years, they could, whether or not we have formally gone through that study, they could pull those additional 63,000 acres if they wanted. So right now, because Congress has not acted um, since 1978 on the wilderness recommendation for the park, by the agency policy, but not by law, we are protecting these places from any development or any motorized activity that might degrade the wilderness character. But that is, some of our supporters call a handshake deal. That can change with any administration um, in, in Washington, and it doesn't, this isn't partisan. Democrats and Republicans have both been strongly endorsed wilderness. So working with a group called Keep Big Bend Wild, very informally organized group, the Park Service has been trying to resurrect 
why that's important. And so nobody's lobbying at this stage, something that I can't do anyway. But I think there's a lot of interest in seeing that vision of our predecessors fulfilled, the, you know, the legacy of a former generation. It's our opportunity to move this forward. So the North Rosia 63,000 acres is not critical for that effort, but now we have looked at the entire park and identified all the acreage in the park that is that meets the characteristics of wilderness. And so hopefully at some point, um, you know, there's enough interest in the public and in our legislators to take that over the finish line and protect these lands forever. Bob, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. You know, this, the podcast I did with Tom, you know, a little more than a year ago, has been our second most downloaded oh, podcast. Oh, really? I yeah. Didn't know. That's great. So I think that just is a reflection of how popular this park has become. So many more people coming here and enjoying it, and what's not to enjoy. No, it's a great place. Well, Lynn, you do a great podcast, and we did two with Kurt on the wilderness issue as well. So um, Big Bend is well represented in, in The Traveler, and we're very grateful for that. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we're going to kick off a two-part series on the role the craggy Teton Range in Grand Teton National Park played in the formation of the U.S. Army's legendary 10th Mountain Division that fought in some of the most rugged mountainous terrain during World War II. I think you'll enjoy it. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Rebencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park Audio Series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.